All right, that is a perfect break. Hope you had the, uh, the frame of mind to set your intentions for today. And uh, hopefully, especially your gratitudes, guys and gals, one of the best things that we can do to overcome our fears and to build our confidence is to just take an assessment of what it is to, um, to be grateful and uh, to recognize all the blessings that we have and, uh, and why this life that we, uh, we experience is so beautiful. And speaking of blessings and gratitudes, I am so grateful, uh, Blake, that you're joining us here this morning. Um, we, you know, we've, we've met a few times for, uh, for lunch and we've had uh, great conversations over the phone. You have, uh, quite frankly, it, in, in times of need for me, when I've, uh, needed some assistance, you have a unique perspective and you've been very helpful to me on a personal level. So I just want to say thank you, uh, for, for that, first of all. So, uh, let's, uh, let's get started. You've taken some time on uh, this morning to get up uh, early, probably no earlier than you normally do, but, uh. <laughs> You've joined, you've joined us, or we've actually joined you, I guess, in your, looks like your den, uh, and uh, we've invaded your home. So thanks for letting us invade your home. Good morning, good morning. Uh, this conversation is going to be about 30 minutes or so. We got a lot to cover. So let me, let me get into this. First of all, I didn't even ask your uh, permission on this, but uh, whether you say yes or no, I'm probably going to do it anyway. But, <laughs> I just want to give uh, the guys and gals who are watching some perspective on, you know, the, the magnitude of your success in this business. First of all, just how long have you been in real estate? So this is my 30th uh, year. Okay. Wow. So do you think you might stick with this thing then? <laughs> I, I joke with my clients that, uh, that you know, I, I've, I've done this once or twice. Yeah. yeah. I, the, the fact is, I don't think that, uh, that more than, um, you know, probably 5% of the people who get into real estate ever achieve that accomplishment. And that's, that's saying something because as you know, every day um, we start over and man, you have got to forge the way every single day. And it's amazing 30 years. So that's great. So having said that, the thing that I was going to disclose to everybody is the level of your success. You know, you, you closed in uh, 2019 on 24 transactions is, is my recollection. Is that correct? Uh, I believe so. It's uh, kind of windled over these last couple, three years. Well, that's me that I, uh, I could uh, promote that I would did about 50 transactions a year. And somehow or other, these last uh, couple, couple, three years has been a little more challenging, but uh, I'm still at it. Well, and, and I appreciate you saying that, but still, I mean, 24 transactions, particularly in the market that you're in, what, what's your average sales price? Uh, I would say my average sales price is probably somewhere around 700000 yeah, I mean, so especially for the folks in Utah, you know, it gives them some perspective that uh, that that is not quite double what the average home is in, in Utah. But, you know, uh, if you were um, to make that ratio change, you know, you're, you're looking at about, you know, probably 35 to 40 transactions in terms of income that we see in Utah on on a typical, um, you know, th over three hundred thousand uh, dollar income at, you know. 24 transactions that's a uh, that's a pretty good ratio so what um i guess you know making over three hundred thousand dollars and you consider that a bad year you, your your business is <laughs> waning and people are listening and saying wow if if that's if that's waning and that's not a good year uh I, i've got some some learning to do and some changes to make in in my business so i, I want to get into that before we do just if you could share with us, who is Blake Mashburn? Um, you know, where do you live? Married? Where'd you grow up? And um, just kind of tell us who you are. Yeah, so um, I'm 59 years of age, and I was born and raised in Ojai, which is about 30 minutes inland from where I reside now in Ventura, California. And um, I was uh, raised with five siblings, two wonderful parents, and uh, we had kind of a, a Walton's family uh, uh, upbringing. And uh, so in 1980, I guess, after graduating high school, I moved to Ventura and never saw fit to leave because it is just a beautiful place. It is gorgeous, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if you know this, but just about uh, three weeks ago, I moved into Ventura. I, I moved you did. I did. Congratulations. So, yeah. So we'll have to get together for lunch again because it's going to make it a lot easier for both of us to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, very cool. Well, so um, if I, well, I, should I guess, probably mention something. Yeah, go ahead. 
And, and I'm, uh, I'm, I've been happily married for uh, 30 years uh, to my life partner, Sean Rollins. That is awesome. Congratulations. And of course, I've met Sean and he is a, a great, great man. So that's, that is fantastic. So 30 years, holy cow. Uh, apparently, you need your head examined, like most real estate <laughs> agents. So what's, what's driven you to stay in real estate for 30 years? Because that's yeah, quite an so, accomplishment. <laughs> so being, being raised by, uh, you know, my parents in Ojai, we were uh, financially poor and uh, rich in so many other ways. And, uh, you know, my parents didn't have a lot of money, so I didn't have any, a lot of options as far as going to college. And uh, so, well, uh, when I bought my first house, I was working uh, in retail, was managing a string of liquor stores for uh, a local Yahoo. And uh, he was making a lot of money and I wasn't. And, uh, but a, a buddy and I, uh, we scraped a few dollars together. And this was uh, right before the uh, meltdown of uh, the real estate market in 1990. I think yeah. we bought, I think we bought our house right about here. And then I think when we closed, it did like this. this All right. Value. So uh, anyways, we were, uh, we were in the house. I had just uh, worked with an agent that I met. Uh, she would come into the store and she let me know that she was in real estate. And uh, she showed us, I think, a total of four homes. Uh, she drove us around in her brand new uh, Nissan Maxima, which was, you know, the equivalent of uh, my Tesla now. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> and she uh, was telling me about how she had just gotten back from a 30-day 30, 30 uh, vacation in Maui. And then I calculated her commission and I thought, you know, uh, I should probably think about doing this. Because you know what I was doing was dead end, right? And and then it dawned on me that my grandfather was a charter member of the Ojai Board of Realtors, and we used to own Mashburn Real Estate on the corner of 150 and 33 up in Ojai. And I was like, "What am I?" I didn't, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. So, anyways, uh, I I, uh, I bought myself a uh, home study course, which um, came in the mail in a box, and and. Uh, there was a bunch of books in there and audio tapes. You remember audio tapes, John? Of course I do. I remember a track <laughs> tapes. I'm not far behind you, young man. And I listened to those audio tapes over and over and over yeah. again. Finally, I tested. And finally, I don't know how many days later, it's not like it is now, I, I got this envelope. And uh, I was so afraid to open it because it really was my future as far as I was concerned, right? It was from the, yeah. the, the uh, Department of Real Estate. I opened it up and I had passed. So um, I continued working at the liquor store and then tried to do real estate uh, part-time. I had long hair. That was back when I had hair. And uh, a beard before they started wearing beards. And, uh, you know, my parents were kind of hippie yuppies, you know. So well, Yeah, you fit into Ojai. I mean, for those yeah, of yeah, exactly. you that don't know Ojai, it, it is kind of hippie hipster, isn't it? Yeah, it is. That's where Johnny Cash had a place there, didn't Johnny he? Johnny Cash had his place up there. Yeah. But anyways, uh, somehow or other, the, uh, the owner of those, the chain of those liquor stores found out that I was doing real estate, uh, you know, on the side. And never did I do real estate on, on the clock with him. But uh, I think he didn't like that because he thought maybe I was going to, you know, work into his retirement and right. he fired me and I thought oh my god the sky is falling I thought you know what am I going to do I just bought a house I've lost my job they teach in this business that you're not going to make any money for six months which by the way I don't like how anyone teaches that thank you thank yeah. you and I went out and I sold my first house it was a wrap if anyone knows what that is so we closed mm -hmm. Astro in about uh, seven days uh, there was no escrow. We basically did the transaction, took the took the deed to uh, uh, to the uh, county recorder's office, uh, office, recorded it, and I got my first check, uh, cashed it, went home, and threw all of it up in the air. <laughs> <laughs> Which resulted, it was only about six thousand dollars, but that was more well, money wait a minute. than I've that ever was... seen. Yeah, well, yeah. How much were you making? You know, peddling. Well, I was making, I think, like ten dollars an hour back then. Well, yeah. So yeah, that, that, so that was, was a lot of money, and yes. uh, and and because you know because my parents didn't have a whole lot of financial wherewithal, I just thought you know this is it. This is what my grandfather did. I enjoy working with people. I am a people person, although I'm believe it or not, I'm actually kind of shy. And uh, and so the rest is history. So that's that how so I got cool. in the business, and the reason I have had the uh, the the. Uh, 
the reason I've been able to stick with it, I think, is because I just feel like uh, for, for a yokel local from Ojai, there's not many other options <laughs> where I can have the lifestyle that I live now. So there you have it. Yeah, that, that is the great thing about this business, that you can go from working at a liquor store Right. You know, to, to making six thousand uh, dollars and uh, and then turn it into a 30 year business, because that's really what you've done. It's yeah. not a job for you. And it really is a business. And you, and it you is treat business. it. As such. Yeah. So cool. Did you just out of curiosity, did your was your grandfather alive when you got into the business? No, unfortunately. He, so he didn't. Yeah. yeah. All right. But I, I uh, when I have when I do my listing presentation, I have a picture that I show my clients of my grandfather in front of his real estate office. And, uh, you know, one of the things he taught me, though, was that if you treat people the way you want to be treated, business will come your way. And that's just, that's how, that's how I do it. Yeah. Yeah. That is so cool. That is great. Thank you for sharing that story. I did not know that. So uh, you do historically a lot of business. You did still a lot of business in 2019. Where are you finding your business? You know, 30 years, that's, that's longevity and you do it at a very high level. So where do you find your business? So, so this is what I, you know, I, I, I uh, when I was invited to do this, um, initially it was right after the, the pandemic and I told your assistant, I it just, I wasn't in the mindset to do it. And uh, I remember. Yeah, because, you know, that's, it's been such a difficult time for all of us. And then uh, your assistant is very persistent and got in touch with me again. <laughs> Are you I surprised? <laughs> I asked our money, I said, what can I, what can I offer? You know, I mean, it, what, that's not already been said. So, oh, um, yeah. So one of the things I wanted to um, share with, every, with everyone is the importance of having a database. Um, because later on in our interview, what I want to share with whomever is on this call is a way where you can exponentially grow your business, exponentially grow your business with a telephone call, with one telephone call. Yeah. And that, you can't do that. And you can't look for a retirement like all of us should be working for, by the way, and saving for and investing in real estate for. I own six homes, all free and clear now. And uh, so they're all cash flowing. And, uh, and, and that, that took a long time. But the, the, the point is, is that most of my business now comes from my past client, my sphere of influence, um, and the database that I've created over 30 years. So that it really for me now, John, it kind of just spins off 30 to 50 transactions a year. And I was an early adapter to a CRM because when I got in the business, I had to learn how to use a fax machine. <laughs> right, I remember those days. Yeah. And I, and I still got the old clunker CRM that I started with, but it works for me. And you've got to stay consistent as far as contacting your database in the manner in which you would want to be contacted. And for me, that's not a telephone call. I don't want people calling me at, at, at the house. But I stay in touch with them through the American Lifestyle Magazine that I send out and that uh, my lender uh, co-sponsors and, and helps to uh, afford. Uh, she has advertising in there. And, uh, and then just through uh, mailings, and I do drop by. So uh, it, uh, for Halloween, I drop uh, pumpkins by. And for uh, Thanksgiving, I invite them to come in and pick up a pumpkin pie or an apple pie. For Christmas, uh, those clients that uh, have referred me something that year uh, or have done a transaction with me that year or are my AA clients, uh, they get a poinsettia from me. So it's, uh, it's warm, it's uh, non-invasive, but it's consistent contact through my database. And that's where my business is coming from now. That is so cool. You know, I, for so many agents, as I talk to them, and I ask them, you know, they tell me that they got a listing or they got a buyer and they put them under contract. I will ask, what was the source of the business? And oftentimes the answer is sphere of influence. But when they say that, they say that with almost guilt or shame, which always surprises me. It's because somehow they think that if it came from that and didn't come from a cold call, that it's, it, it's not as worthy or worthwhile. And my opinion is it's exactly the opposite. I mean, I think we should be prospecting, right, and trying to, make, trying to expand our sphere of influence. But man, the most important thing that we can do, and you just said it here, and what you shared with us is having a database and treating those people the way we would want to be treated and doing that consistently 
week after week, month after month, year after year, that you can turn a, a job in real estate into a career and a business that will give you the longevity like you've had for 30 years to the point where, as you said, really it just comes to you. I mean, that's really, that is a business. That's a business. Right? Yeah, it's no longer a job at that point. Right, and that's the, that's the cool thing. And yet what we know is that there's a lot of hard work to get from, from the beginning to where you are. So what, what, what do you think that, uh, you know, your income puts you in the top 1%, not only in real estate agents, but in terms of households in the United States. So what are you doing differently? I mean, you've got a lot of people who are listening right now, brand new, but also veterans who've been in the business five, 10, 15 years or more and aren't making what you're earning on an annual basis. So what are you doing differently from what you see other agents doing? Yeah. So, so listen, um, you know, when I got first got into the business, uh, it was tough. I mean, this, this business, don't let anyone tell you it's easy. It's not. I mean, you know, you gotta, you gotta get up and you gotta treat it like a J O B right. You got, you know, I get in, I get in the office at 9 AM. I'm home for lunch at 12. I'm, and then I'm, I'm back to work at one and I'm, and I, unless I have a morning appointment, I'm, I'm home at five. I go, I exercise, I swim, I go on walks. You know, you've got to do those kind of things that feed your soul so that you can uh, have that energy to give back to people. But, you know, when you're first getting started, you know, believe me, I, I, uh, I followed Mike, Mike Ferry and uh, I, I, I joke sometimes that he saved my real estate career, but almost killed it. Uh, because, you know, uh, at the time he was training, this was in the 1990s, when you had to carry an inventory of 25 listings, which I did, in order to sell one a month. Yeah. You know, to sell one a month. If, you know, it, it was like if you bought a house, you know, if you bought a, uh, a toaster, you got a house for free, right? I mean, right. That's, that's how difficult it was. I mean, honestly, those years were diff more difficult than, than the 07 meltdown, frankly. Yeah, you're talking about the SNL uh, yeah. crisis. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, so Mike, Mike Ferry, listen, he, he, uh, he got me to, to ditch my desk, to ditch my, uh, my uh, chair. I, I got put a counter in my office, and I put a headphone on my, on my, my head, headset on my head, and a, and a mirror in front of me, and I dialed for dollars for five hours a day. And if I wasn't doing that, I was door knocking. And if I wasn't doing that, I was chasing after expireds. And if I wasn't doing that, I was, I was chasing after FISBOs. And believe me, it was grueling. And so that's why I say, it said, you know, it, it, he, he saved my career. But then in retrospect, I looked, at, I looked at this and I thought, man, if this is what real estate is going to, re going to require, I don't know that I can keep doing this for 30 years. Right. Because right? this is right to. after I got my that'd, real estate license. Yeah, that'd be brain damage for 30 years. It really would. Yeah. So, so then I came upon this guy by the name of uh, uh, Craig Proctor. Yeah. And uh, C Craig was out of uh, Canada and I went, flew up to uh, Toronto and I, I studied under him for, uh, for the time that I forget what that was at the time, but maybe a couple, three days. And he, tr he, uh, he trained about uh, direct response marketing, right? Run an ad, uh, have people respond to you and then you can follow up with them. Right. So, rather than chasing, uh, kind of encouraging, right? And, uh, and that too, I think, I implemented uh, 1-800 numbers that he was espousing at the time. And that really did kind of change things for me. But um, I, I don't know, um, to answer your question, I think you gotta get out there and do the hard work. But, but the, one of the first things I would uh, suggest to anyone is you gotta have a CRM and you gotta have a database. You gotta nurture that database. You gotta treat people the way they, they you know, way you would want to be treated, um, ask for the referrals. And uh, if you do all of those things and combination, yeah. do it over a, a period of time, it, the business is, can be very rewarding. Yeah, I mean, what, ultimately what I hear you saying is, regardless of where you are in your career, it has to be a combination of two approaches. We've got to proactively reach out to people, meaning we've either got to pick up the phone or knock on their doors those two things, but then also do the more passive stuff, but do that consistently in, 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 in form of a drip campaign where we are yes. posting social media, <clears throat> you know, back in the day when we got into the business, you were mailing postcards, you know, right. agents are still doing that. Maybe not as effective, but you know, there wasn't social media back then. Social media for us was the, uh, the, the I guess the help, the wanted ads, those sorts of things, you know, that was, that was it. But, um, but doing those two things and by, by putting together a CRM, by 
doing the cold calling, by doing what Mike Ferry suggested, right, you were able to build a sphere of influence that then allowed you over time to transition from the majority of your business coming from going out and chasing it to the majority of your business coming to you, which again goes back to the point that you really create a business by doing that, but you have to do both and you have to do it simultaneously. Yes. Right? Yeah. In other words, you have to operate it like a business. Yes. Yeah. And what I hear, because as you described what you, what you said there, uh, Blake, very important in terms of your schedule. It is obvious that you are very regimented. It was, it, it, I could hear it in your tonality and then giving specific times as to what you do and what you're doing. So <clears throat> let's, it, maybe we can break that down a little bit. Uh, so when you get into the office, and, and by the way, let's make certain that we give some recognition to somebody that, that you work with. She's an amazing lady, kind lady, but a, a professional, and she certainly keeps you in line. Yes, she does. So I, 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 talk couldn't about do, I couldn't do what I do without my Lori. Yeah. And, uh, she's my office wife and, and a friend, and we do things outside of, uh, outside of work, and, and uh, I just love her dearly. I know you do. I know you do. And I can hear it in the emotion, that, which is great. Um, and and I, I, the reason I wanted to mention that is because one, she certainly contributes and she's a very pivotal part of what you accomplish on a, on a daily and annual basis. And yet you don't have buyer's agents. You don't have this large team. You've been able to do what you do uh, really um, as an agent on your own, notwithstanding Lori's help as an assistant. So very fantastic. And Armani said, Lori's a diamond. There's no question, Armani. She is a diamond. So, um, and you know, John, yeah, go, go ahead. I, 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 there was a time uh, just right before uh, the transition from uh, Troop Real Estate to Everest, where I, I had build, built a, a team, a team of buyers, agents, and Lori and I. And, you know, I, uh, I, I think I realized then that. Uh, what you and and uh, George and Armani do is not what uh, I'm good at, <laughs> which is managing and motivating and and uh, you know and and uh, I, I so I the the team the team thing wasn't wasn't for me. Um, well, that's a full time job in and of itself. And then you have to worry about selling real estate, right? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's great. So your schedule on a day to day basis just. If you can, because there, there are those who are looking at the schedule and saying, okay, I got to tighten this up. I've got to do something differently. And there are some people who are relatively new and they're trying to create some sort of schedule. So a guy who is selling real estate to the level that you have for, you know, three decades, it would be interesting to hear, okay, this is what I do. I go to bed at this time. I get up at this time. And these are the things that I do. And one of the things that I heard in your explanation of your schedule is that it really is a whole approach that you don't just focus on real estate. You know, a lot of people, especially when they're new in the business or they're younger, you know, in their 20s, 30s, especially, they really get into the business. And I mean, they get into the business and they work a lot of hours, which is great. And at times it takes that. And yet they ignore other parts of their life. They, they ignore their health and their relationships to their detriment. And it causes a breakdown, breakdown of their health and also in their relationships. And that's not sustainable. And that's not quality. Because if you, if you have a lot of money, but you have poor health or you don't have people in your life you love or who love you, the money doesn't mean anything. Right. So, so what, what are you doing? Just kind of break down that schedule for us. Well, I, I, I kind of went over it already, but I, you know, I get up at about uh, 4.45 every morning. <laughs> so the question, is there oxygen at that time of the morning? Is there really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I get up that early because uh, Sean is uh, an RN and he has to get up and go to work uh, early. And so I just feel like I might as well get up and, and uh, see him off to work. And, and then, you know, I, I try to take some time to meditate in the morning. I, it used to be when I was younger, I would go to the gym and work out and I, I just don't have that uh, uh, energy anymore. So I, anyways, I get up uh, early, I try to do a little meditation. Um, you know, I, I'll check my emails and my tech, text messages in the morning. And then like I said earlier, I, I will get in the office around nine o'clock. And yeah. uh, you know, if it's, if it's 9.15, uh, Lori says to me, uh, good afternoon. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's called accountability. Yeah, because she, she's, she's been, that's right, because she's been there since, you know, eight or eight. So pause for a second on that, because that's really important. I want everybody to listen to what you just said there. That, that, account, that accountability is important. I got to imagine that you, you said that, and it's funny, but at the same time, you think about that. Yes. But when you're coming in, you know that she's going to confront you if you're not coming in at nine. If you're coming in at nine fifteen, and most people say, "Well, what's the big deal? It's only fifteen minutes." Well, no, wait a minute. There's a schedule to be followed. Yeah, there is. There is a lot to be said for accountability, and and uh, not everyone can have a Lori, but um, you know, you can uh, you can hold yourself accountable or find find somebody, you know, a, a, an office colleague to to hold you accountable. Whomever it is, your office manager, because right. you know. Um, not only with regard to being in the office uh, on time and is Lori holding me accountable, but I also have a certain responsibility or, or, or a sense of responsibility to do a number of transactions so as to afford, you know, me uh, a certain lifestyle, uh, but also her and her family because, you know, she gets bonused on everything that I'm doing. Right. So, uh, so there's that accountability there too. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, such an such an important point, such a selfless point to say people depend upon me. If I'm not doing my job, then you know I can't deliver to them what they deserve. Yeah, and so she deserves somebody sense. who's going to show up and work. Yeah, so I I, I get in the office and and uh, usually I have a check in with Lori, just go over escrows, and uh, she'll give me kind of a rundown on where we are, and we'll uh, put together kind of an action plan for that day. Uh, I get to my desk and uh, figure out what I need to get done. Generally, the morning is, for me is just, you know, catching up with uh, incoming text messages, emails, voicemails, and uh, just making sure that I get through all of that. Uh, I'm, then, like I said, I'm usually home by uh, 12 noon. I come home. I have a simple lunch. Um, I put my feet up in my recliner. People ask me out to uh, lunch. You, you're, you uh, included, John. <laughs> and it's hard to get me to go out because I really – do like uh, my solitude, I guess. Well, in your routine. Right? Yeah, and my routine, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm back in the office at one o'clock and that's usually when I have uh, uh, either showing uh, appointments or um, you know, listing appointments. And I'm generally home by about five o'clock so that I can then jump into the pool or you know, take a good walk with Sean. And then I'm in bed by about uh, eight or 8.15. <laughs> that's so good for you. That's, well, no, that's wait, it in the nutshell. Going? Yeah, but you're going to bed at 8, 8, 15 because you're getting up at 4, 45, right? Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. The earlier you get up, the earlier you got to go to bed. So. Yeah. yeah, so that is great. So where, where in that schedule are you uh, working with your database? What, what does that look like for you so, now? Yeah, so uh, keep in mind that my database is uh, automated. So uh, there's a always a drip system going out to... Uh, my prospects or my, my database, uh, past clients, sphere of influence and prospects that is automated. And I think it's really important. That was one of the things that uh, uh, Sanford, what was the guy's name? The trainer? Uh, uh, which trainer? Remind Walter me. Walter Sanford. Well, that was one of the things that Walter Sanford is a real estate. Oh, yeah, yeah. Do. You know, he, he used to really have, uh, uh, he used to tr train, you know, trying to automate things uh, so that you don't have to, uh, you know, continue to do it yourself. So my database, my CRM is, is, has automated that. Um, I, I do have Lori that uh, helps me uh, maintain that as well. And then I also have a, a millennial uh, who's been provided, uh, her service has been provided to me uh, by the lender that I work with. Um, and, and basically she helps with all the social media, uh, the email blasts, and um, and the kind of stuff that I'm not, not really that good at. <laughs> okay, that's great. So Bridget, I saw a, a question come through on the chat. Uh, Terry Taylor asked the question, what CRM do you use? You, you said you use a pretty dated one. It, yeah. it may not be available, does it? It's, it's not even supported anymore, so I won't, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I won't, I won't <laughs> mention the name. I would just say get one that, that works for you. You know, I mean, yeah. I, I tried Top Producer back when they first came out with it, and it was so, I mean, I, it was, I'm sure it was great, and I'm sure it still is great, but I, 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 I couldn't fathom it. So well, I needed just a simple one, and that's why I stuck with it. 
Yeah, to your point, and I guess this is what I would say to Terry, the best uh, CRM is the one that you'll use. Exactly. That really it is because there, there is no best one. It really depends upon how tech oriented you are and what exactly you want it to do. And um, look, I, I, I'm not tech oriented. So my CRM is not going to be as complicated as a millennial who, you know, was raised on computer screens on right. a smartphone. And so it, it, the answer I think is just simply the one that you'll use, but you have to have one. It's so important to have a system as, as Walter Sanford said, so that you get predictability and duplication of outcome. If you rely on systems, you get more consistent outcomes. And that's really what we're looking for in, uh, this, in this business is predictability and duplication of outcome. You know, so, John, that, yeah, go ahead. That, that question uh, re reminded me of something that uh, Mike Ferry used to train. And, and that was, uh, you know, so many of us are ready, aim, and we never get to fire, right? He, yeah. he, used to train, he used to train ready, fire, ready, fire. And, and so that's what I would, I would say is whatever it is you're trying to figure out, whether it's a postcard or a CRM, CRM just do it. Yep, I, I agree. Yeah. And so th to that point, let me ask you, if somebody's business isn't where they want it to be, you know, they're not producing at the level that you are, they're brand new in the business or they're a veteran and it's just not where they want it to be, what would you suggest that they immediately do the first thing, the very first thing that they, sh that they should be doing? What, what advice would you give? Well, I, I used to say that if you didn't have a listing, borrow someone's listing and then market the heck out of it. And then once, and then, and then once you sell that listing, then market the fact that you sold that listing and then just do that over and over again. Pretty soon those listings will become yours, right? right. Because all you're trying to do in market in marketing a listing for sales to attract the buyer that you can work with. Right. Right. Yep. Even if yep. And work, find more listings. Cause you've got, right. you got to find a buyer or a seller in this business. That's right. So that how really, do you find them? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Well, so what, um, what would you say is the biggest challenge? 30 years is a long time for you to see agents come and go. Um, some succeed at a very high level, a, a lot not, and, and eventually get out of the business. What do you see is the number one challenge or mistake that agents uh, face or make uh, in the business? Well, for me, one of the biggest challenges I've had over the years is changing. <laughs> change. Mm. It's, yeah. I mean, we, as, as humans, it's in our nature to, to fight change, right? But you've got to change in this business. And I'm having to constantly tell myself and Lori that, that we've got to change with the business. And, and that's as simple as changing with the market. I mean, you know, back in 06, it was like you told your buyers to line outside your door and take a number, right? Yeah. And, then, and then just two or three years later, it was, you know, it was like, the buyers were gone and now you had to have, you know, now you had to start working uh, short sales. And, and believe me, Lori and I, we transitioned our business from working with buyers and, you know, 04, 05, 06, right. To then doing nothing, hardly nothing other than just short sales. And they were brutal, but guess what? We made it through that part of, of the uh, real estate history, market history, because we were willing to change. And, and now we've got the pandemic, right? That we're having to, all of us learn, you know, how do we do business in this? And believe me, I, I, this old dog <laughs> had some problems with that. You know, I mean, Armani yeah. sitting down in front of me uh, in my office and I just, I said, look, I'm not usually like this, but I am depressed. And I don't, I don't know what to do with myself right now. You know, I mean, the market, had, all we know the market came to a screeching halt and, and uh, you know, basically he said, just keep doing what you're doing. The market will change and, and things will get better and, and they have. So I think the, the hardest thing for me over my 30 year career is just changing. And, uh, and I would just tell everyone that you've gotta be willing to change with the market. You've gotta be willing to change as far as your technology. You gotta be willing to change with how society wants to uh, work uh, work with you as a, as a, as right. a professional. Yeah. And it has changed a lot, hasn't it? I mean, it has when you and I got in the business, uh, the, the, virtually there were no cell phones. I mean, there were some, there were boxes in a car attached to a cord, right? 
Right. Uh, and very few people had that. And then we got pages. Remember that? How yes. cool that was. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, things have certainly changed. Well, so you, every time I see you, you have a, a big smile and you always have a very positive attitude. Um, you did say, though, that you went through, through a period of time where you were depressed. But uh, how, do you, how, do you, how do you maintain such a positive attitude? You, you can't be in business for 30 years in real estate and not be positive. So you're, you're doing something. Where, what do you think that comes from? What are you doing consistently that other people can hear and say, OK, I need to make sure I'm doing more of that? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm naturally positive anyways. Um, but uh, I, I, I wanna, one of the things I wanted to convey here too is that um, you know, we all have our ups and our downs. And uh, you know, to, to deny that is, is not to be real. Right. And uh, so I wanted to convey to everybody that, yeah, I have my ups and downs. I have my challenges just like everyone else. But you, know, you pick yourself up by your pants or your boots and you just, you know, you just keep moving. But as far as you know, what I do to, uh, to keep, you know, the positive attitude um, is, I think, again, just maintaining a schedule, maintaining hours, and maintaining limits with your clients and, and your colleagues. What, you know, if, if you call my voicemail, John, you're going to get a long voicemail, and some people hate it, and some people love it. It's, and the people that love it are the ones that understand that they, like me, are, are, are uh, setting limits and setting expectations. It is so interesting you say that because I called your uh, number yesterday <laughs> and, and, uh, and I listened to it and I'm, I've heard it before, but I have to I tell you, and I say this genuinely, I listened to it and I thought, you know, this is the, one of the great things about Blake because he is so systematic in his approach. I know you are. And I know that, and this is what I said to myself, I said, this attracts a particular type of client who likes consistency and predictability of outcome. Right. And, and, and those sorts of people are easier to work with and tend to be people who have more money because you have to live your life that way in order to have money. Correct. If, if, if you're undisciplined, right? If you, there is no system, if there is no predictable you know, approach, duplicable approach, you're not getting great results. Right. And I listened to that. I thought that is so cool. It, it is long, but the <laughs> thing is, it's that's fine because obviously it works. I think it's fantastic. I really do. Yeah. Well, basically, what I'm I'm doing there is I like like you're saying I'm setting the limits. You know, it, it says, look, I, I work Tuesday through Friday nine to five. I work Saturdays and Sunday by appointment only. So don't yeah. please don't call me up on a Saturday morning and say you want to look at property at four o'clock because I'm not going to be available. If you yeah. want to set an appointment in advance, I'll do my very best to accommodate you. And then it says, and this is most important, it says, I'm off on Mondays. Spend yes. quality time with family and friends. And, it's, yeah. and it's, it's people that appreciate that. And I have people tell me that. Yes. I really, I, I appre I've had people tell me, I like that so much, I know you're my agent. Yes, so yeah. that is so interesting because there are people who are listening right now who they, when you first said it, I say, oh, I, I couldn't do that. That doesn't make any sense because I have to be available for people 24 seven. That's just the way real no. estate is. And the answer is what? No. no, no, it's not. The more you treat it like a business, the more you get business results. It's, it is fascinating to me. It's, it's like going to your doctor, your dentist. You don't call up your doctor, your dentist office and say, I need to come in. I've got a cracked tooth. I'll be there at noon. Be ready for me. Yeah. That's not the way it works. But would you want to go to that dentist? No. <laughs> you're gonna, right? you're gonna go in. You're gonna go in there, and it's gonna be mayhem. Exactly. Right? It'll be like a triage. It's gonna yeah. be like an emergency room. Yeah. You want to work with the doctor that you have to make the appointment three months in advance, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. Not it's, it's one where you call and say you're gonna be there tomorrow, and and you know I'll be there on, at, whenever. Yeah. And scary. He says I'm available. I <laughs> know it's very scary. Oh yeah, I got nothing go else going on, so I might as well. Yeah. You no. Know? And you know, I'll, I, and I've said this for years is that it doesn't matter what your appointment is, but it's okay to tell people that you have an appointment. And that appointment could be being at home at five o'clock to have dinner with your husband, and that's okay, right. right? That's right. That's okay. Yep. 
you could say, unfortunately, I'm not going to be available on Mondays because I take that time off to be with family and friends. And that's going to be okay. You have got to create a system and standards. And, and every agent has system and standards. The problem is for a lot of them, they ain't working out too well. Well, and you know, a lot of agents will, they'll listen to that voicemail and they'll, and then, you know, that maybe they leave a message or maybe they call me the next day because it's Monday and they say, I really admire that. I wish I could do that. Well, do well, they it. Could. Yeah, they could. Ready, ready, fire, ready, fire. Well, here's, here's the challenge. I think that most agents are unwilling to do that because they think that if they do that, they won't have any business. And what you know is that if they will do that, if they will create systematic approaches, if they'll have a schedule, I wrote it down, have a schedule, get up at a defined time early, 445, meditate, right? Then look at your email and start to respond to those things. Get in the office at nine o'clock, not, not in the afternoon at 915, right? <laughs> <laughs> Show up at nine, like you're supposed to, right. right? And then when noon comes, after you've done your job up to that point, then go home. That's what you're doing to have lunch, right? A lot of agents say, well, I just, I don't, I'm too busy. I can't eat lunch. And again, my, my, the point is you have to take a whole approach to this thing. If you're going to be in this business for 30 years, you better damn well treat yourself right. Mentally, physically, right. emotionally, spiritually. Amen. Right? And you have got to have a schedule. And part of that is setting limits with your clients and not yeah. answering phone calls at 10 o'clock at night or midnight. I remember my first few years in the business, I was taking calls. I remember a call that I took at midnight. <laughs> Brain damage, Blake. I yeah. would never do that now. And a lot of agents say, well, that's what you're supposed to do. That's what separates me from the competition. I'm, it, it's not sustainable and you will not last in this business doing that. Right. Yeah, that's right. And by, by doing those things that you just beautifully uh, laid out, um, it then also allows you to, like myself, I enjoy RVing. You know, we've, we've got a beautiful new RV and we, we'll take that out for a weekend and, and uh, it, but it's scheduled, right? So, you know, I've got my schedule covered uh, during that time because I plan for it. Or it also allows me to, you know, uh, do international travel when once we are able to do that again. Right. Um, and it allows me to come home and to, to enjoy my swimming pool or to go on a, on a power walk because I've, I've already set things up uh, to, to provide me that end result, right? Right. What, 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 is it, what is it I want? Was it George, George said in a, in a talk last week on Zoom, you know, ask yourself, what is, you, what is it you want? And then plan for that. Right. Well, Zig Ziglar, I think, said it best. He said, be where you are. Hmm. Be where you are. If you will simply schedule yourself and do the things that you say that you're going to do, whether it's leisure or work, Right? right. That if you do that, that consciously, you know, your, your sense of, of, uh, of, of self and confidence, it says it's okay for me to be home at five, yeah. or it's okay for me to take Monday off because I have stuck to my schedule of getting up at 445, getting to the office at nine and doing my job consistently. It's just part of the what? The plan. Right. It's part of the plan. Right. And, and, and I want to just share too that you know, that's the plan. I, it doesn't always work, right? I mean, I don't want anyone to think that, you know, that there's no, there's no fluidity to this, that it's just this way or, you know, that, that it's that rigid, that, it, you know. I, of course, I break my own rules, but the fact of the matter is, is that they're there, and I know if I'm breaking them. And it's, and it's me who's choosing to break them if I do. Right. Well, I, I thought you were perfect. So we're done. I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, like I say that if you identify what you should be doing 100% of the time and do it 80% of the time, you're still going to get 100% or more of the results that you want. Right. That's a fact. It yeah. is. Because you reap more than you sow. You know, you plant you plant a, uh, a seed and it grows into an apple tree. You don't just get one apple. You get many apples year after year after year. So, man, it's just identify a schedule, you know, put together a plan and follow it consistently. I, we're at the end of our time. It went so quickly. I, and I told, I told you it was in the last 30 minutes. It lasted a lot more, but I was having a great time having a conversation. Me, with me too, but I've got to share one last thing. Please. It's, it's, it's what I promised earlier, and it's why I, 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 it's the one thing I wanted to share more than anything else. 
And oh, that is it. how you can exponentially grow your business with a telephone call. Oh, yes. Yes, thank you. Do we have time for me to share that real quickly? Of course we do, yes. Oh, okay. So listen, it's you probably- no need to rush. Take your time. It's, you it's probably no secret that, uh, you know, if you come into my office, you've seen it, John, it, there's, a, there's a date on my, on my desk. Yes, I'm very familiar uh, with it. It says 228-23. It actually changed from 228-21 to 228-23. I know that. Okay. What is that? That's your that's, retirement date. That's my retirement date. Right? Yeah. And, it's, and uh, so I'm sharing, I'm sharing that to, pro to provide some perspective on, on uh, what I'm about to share for everyone else as to how you can exponentially grow your business with a telephone call. I came across a book uh, recently, and it's called The Golden Handoff. Have you heard of it? I, ha I have not read it, no. Okay. It, as far as I know, it's the first book that's been written on how you can retire from a real estate business or career like mine with a residual income by basically selling your book of business, right? To, a, right. to an adopting agent, which goes back to why it's so critical. And one of the first things that needs to happen in anyone's real estate business is to put together your database, get a CRM, put your database together and nurture Great. it. So yeah. that you have something to sell after you've spent 30 years in, in, in the trenches. Yep. But here's something even more important. That book also teaches how a newer agent might look for agents like myself because there are signs that uh, as to how to identify a retiring agent and then you go you make a telephone call that agent and there are the, the book teaches how you can uh introduce yourself to that agent and let him or her know that you are in, interested in adopting their business so imagine that so I have a business, a book of business that I have built over 30 years. Right. That's a lot of sweat and tears. And if you, John, came to me and said, Blake, I, you know, I have admired you over all these years. I've watched your business. And, and, and if I'm not mistaken, may I ask, are, you know, do you have plans of retiring? Yeah, I do, John. I'd like to talk to you about adopting your book of business. Imagine being able to do that and to then multiply your business with a telephone call. And of course, it's going to require some follow-up and some meetings and some plans, of course. contracts and all that. All of that's in this book. But imagine adopting my book of business that spins off 30 to 50 transactions a year like clockwork and results in three hundred to $500,000 a year income. Crazy. Go out, go out and buy that book. Go on to, to Amazon or Google now and buy the book. It's called The Golden Handoff. And if you're interested in learning how to retire with a residual income, which I'm going to do having sold my book of business in, t in a couple years, or if you're younger and you want to exponentially grow your business, and by the way, you don't have to limit yourself to one retiring agent. Imagine imagine adopting the book of business from two or three or more retiring agents. Yeah. That's, that's called thinking big. That's huge. It is. Huge. If I, if that had been introduced to me 20 years ago, yeah. you know, I would have been out there talking to the agents that I have seen come and go and have had a, 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 a great book of business. Yeah. I could well, have adopted. Well, you'd be worth billions instead of millions. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, so I, wanted, I wanted to share that with everybody. Oh, I think it's great. And so, yeah. the, and I, I also tell... wanted to share with everyone, make sure you buy real estate as an investment so that you have a residual income when it comes time to retiring. Yeah, so, so important. Because real estate agents otherwise don't have a retirement. Very few agents will save money. So man, why not invest in the thing that you understand? Because you see the opportunities, they are there, you understand the business, you see the ebb and flow of the market, and you know, you know best when to when to buy and uh, 
and uh, it's it's what we understand. So it's it's critical. It makes uh, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Blake, so, uh, amazing, amazing. It was a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. I, I wrote down here because I just want to I want to encapsulate, kind of give a synopsis of, of the things that you said, uh, just for everybody to digest to make certain that they caught the points, and uh, they can go back and reflect on it and hopefully make these changes, incorporate them. But one of the things that you said in the very beginning is that there's this idea that if you're new in the business, it's going to take six months to earn an income. And you and I both know that's nonsense because I know agents who brand new in the business have made over $250,000 their first yeah. year. I know agents who've done that. Uh, you said that your, your grandpa taught you basically the golden rule, treat others the way you want to be treated. So important, especially in this business, because this business is not about homes. It's about people. Yes. And the more we understand that, the better able we're going to be able to do what you did, Blake, and what you're doing, which is to create a business that relies upon people that serves them and you well for decades. And that is so critical. The, th the third thing that I wrote down here is have a database. And what I wrote down next to that, we really talked about that a lot, is treat this as a business. Guys and gals, you have a business. And if you don't have a database and some form of a CRM, and again, it doesn't matter which one it is. It's the most important one is the one that you'll use. If you don't have that, you don't have a business. And if you don't have a business, what you have in real estate is a job. And I can tell you this, real estate is too damn difficult to treat it like a job and get paid like you have a job. It's only worthwhile doing it if you get paid like you own a business. Is that not true? It's absolutely true. Yeah. So the, and, then, and then the last thing that I wrote down here was kind of a combination of things is just having the schedule and making certain that, that schedule is a whole approach, that it's not just about your business, that it's about your relationships, it's about your health, and it is about your business. And that all of that, if you do that, if you have a schedule and it's a whole approach and you do it consistently, it is the number one thing that you can do to build and protect your mindset. That consistency in doing the right things, including the meditation, your power walks or going to the gym or whatever it is, and eating consistently and spending time with those people you love and who love you, there isn't anything that you could do better to get a more consistent, powerful mindset. Blake, that's golden nuggets that you have handed us this morning. You should sell this stuff and retire on that. Forget this real estate gig. Man, <laughs> Thank you, you are. It was, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Of course, my pleasure. And um, thanks for sharing your time and your wisdom. And uh, I look forward to that lunch and it's on me again this time. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Okay, guys and gals, let's finish this up with some closing.